welcome to Chagpar MD. I'm Dr. Anise Chagpar. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I'm a breast cancer surgeon and the daughter of a breast cancer survivor. This month, we're gonna be talking all about breast cancer and how we can reduce our risk. Well, so often people talk about getting screened, but have you ever wondered, what's the best form of screening? Like, should I be getting a mammogram? And what do they mean by 3D mammograms? What about ultrasound? What about MRI? How do I square all of the different professional societies' recommendations in terms of mammography? When should I start? When should I stop? How frequently should I have mammograms? Well, I thought I would provide you all of the data to help answer some of those questions so that you're a better informed consumer. So what do you say? Let's get started. Now, for many of you, we all know that breast cancer screening is really important. Um, it helps us to find cancer early when it's most treatable. But these days, there's been so many advances in terms of how we can screen people that it really leaves people with a bit of confusion. Now, we did a video not long ago on screening and prevention in low resource settings, and I will leave you the link to that video here. But this video really takes things a little step further in terms of talking about screening, particularly in high risk settings, and how we approach it. Now, there is no question that screening mammography saves lives. This is a table that summarizes for you the number of trials that have been done that have looked at screening mammography. And you can see that when you summarize all of this data, there is clearly a risk reduction associated with mammography for women between the ages of 50 and 69. So if you look at that relative risk is less than one and the 95% confidence interval does not cross one. However, when you look at the group of patients between the ages of 40 and 49, you find that the relative risk reduction is lower and the 95% confidence interval crosses one, which means that the data are less robust in terms of whether screening mammography really does improve mortality in this group. And so when you look at the deaths prevented over 10 years, it is significantly less than for the older category. Similarly, if you look at women older than age 70, and the trials have only been done between the ages of 70 and 74. Again, the relative risk crosses one in terms of the 95% confidence interval. And so there is some question as to the efficacy of screening in these populations. When we look at professional society recommendations, however, you can see that the data in terms of including patients between the ages of 50 and 69 are included amongst all of them. Where they vary, however, is when to start screening, when to stop screening, and how often to screen. Now, most of the trials that have provided us data have looked at a biennial screening strategy. That is to say, getting a mammogram at least once every two years. And so you can see this is why the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends biennial screening, as does the American Academy of Family Practice. Now, you can also see that both of those groups uh, start screening at the age of 50 and stop at the age of 75 because that's where the data are the strongest. Other groups, for example, the American College of Radiology or the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, have argued that the screening should start earlier at the age of 40. Now, why is that? Well, they argue that whereas the trials really showed the maximal benefit in the group between the ages of 50 and 69, that that younger cohort tends to get more aggressive cancers. And so it's 
more important to find cancers in that younger population. Now, that younger population also has more dense breast tissue, which may make mammography less effective, but it is something that they consider. As well, those groups consider annual mammography. Again, the idea being, can we catch cancers earlier by screening every year as opposed to every two years? Now, when to stop screening? Well, here's where things vary again. Some argue that you should stop at the age of 75. After all, there were no clinical trials done for women older than 75. However, 75 isn't what it used to be. And many women who reach the age of 75 are still healthy and vibrant and have a significant life expectancy left to live. And so other recommendations, so for example, the American College of Radiology or the American Cancer Society really look at things in terms of years left of life expectancy, whether that's five to seven years or 10 years, but really thinking about age, not as a definitive cut point, but thinking about your life expectancy. Now, I don't know about all of you, but none of us have a crystal ball to really look at our life expectancy. But the idea behind these recommendations is to think about your overall health and at what point finding a breast cancer is going to be of importance to you. I would argue that for some women who may even be younger, who may have a myriad of other health issues, that an early detection of a breast cancer may be the least of their concerns. And some women who are significantly older um, may have very active, vibrant lives and finding uh, a small breast cancer may be something that they really want to treat, even well into their 80s. So it's important for you to look at all of these recommendations and think about what is going to be best for you. Now, it's important to remember that mammography, while it does save lives, does have some harms as well, as do all screening techniques. And for those of you who missed our prostate screening uh, video, I will leave you a link for that here. But as with prostate cancer, one of the issues with mammography is overdiagnosis. That is to say that we can find cancers that if you left them alone, they would never do you any harm anyways. And so you go under all of the diagnosis and treatment for naught, as well as all of the concomitant risks of that diagnosis and treatment. As well, mammography exposes you to radiation. Now, it's not a lot of radiation, but it is radiation nonetheless. And there is a small, very small, but definitive chance of secondary malignancies associated with screening mammography. On top of which, there is the anxiety, the pain, albeit for a few seconds, associated with mammography itself. And it's not a panacea. Um, mammography is associated with false negative rates, particularly in women with dense breast tissue. And for those in whom it does find something, there are the risks associated with biopsy as well. Now, what about the types of mammography? These days we hear about so many different types and people may be confused as to what we mean by all of them. Well, here we go. The first type is analog or screen film mammography, which still is in practice in many parts of the third world, but really has not um, remained a mainstay in much of the Western world. We've now moved to digital mammography, which is where films are all digitized, very much like your camera. Analog or screen film is what you would think of like an SLR camera, where you'd actually have to print the picture out on film. Whereas digital is what we use with our iPhones or our digital cameras where everything is saved um, digitally. The advantage of course of that is that you can adjust, you can tweak the contrast, uh, the, the color, um, the brightness, um, and help you to see things a little bit better, which means fewer callbacks. 
Now, the other thing that's happened in recent years is the advent of something called tomosynthesis or 3D mammography. These are synonymous terms. I've already talked a few times or alluded a few times to the idea of dense breast tissue. Now you can imagine that dense breast tissue, which looks white on mammography, if you think about squishing the breast, um, you can take what is a dense organ and make it look denser. And traditional mammography does just that. It squishes the breast in one plane and then in the other plane, giving us two two-dimensional images that help us to kind of get an idea of what's going on in the breast in three-dimensional space. With tomosynthesis, however, this is much more like a CT scan. It's taking thin slices through the breast in both planes, which really allows the radiologist to pan in and out as though looking through layers of onion skin. So you take what is normally a dense organ and make each layer much less dense. And what the data have found is that there are fewer recall rates and you're able to see things a little bit better. So pick up cancers a little bit more accurately than you would with a simple uh, 2D mammogram. So here I show you the difference. Um, this first panel is a plain uh, digital mammogram and you can see that this looks like normal dense breast tissue. But if you pan in and out of that with 3D mammography, you can pick up this spiculated stellate lesion here, which turns out to be a cancer. Now, what about ultrasound? Ultrasound has found to be a great adjunct to mammography. It's not usually a substitute for mammography but it is an adjunct that can help us to differentiate cystic from solid lesions. Um, you can see here, this ultrasound is nice and round and smooth um, and black with some through transmission, a classic cyst. Whereas this one is more jagged, uh, taller than wide, more irregular, more hypoechoic, so gray, which is a solid lesion. This means that ultrasound is very good in dense breast tissue. However, it is user dependent. So how good that ultrasound is really depends a little bit on the technologist. The other advantage, however, of ultrasound is that it doesn't use radiation. Now, we didn't talk very much about ultrasound in our video looking at screening in low resource settings. However, there have been some randomized controlled trials that have looked at ultrasound in these settings and have found that actually there was no difference in detection, specificity, or positive predictive value when looking at mammography versus ultrasound versus both in a randomized control trial of high risk Chinese women. Now, ultrasound, however, was significantly cheaper, which means that this may be something worthwhile considering in these low resource settings. The Akron 6666 trial, which was done here in the US, also found that cancer detection rates were similar. However, ultrasound tended to detect more node negative invasive cancers, um, less likely to pick up calcifications that may be associated with DCIS or stage zero cancer. It also had a higher recall and biopsy rate and a lower positive predictive value, which means that at least in Western countries, mammography remains the mainstay of screening with ultrasound as an adjunct. Now, what about MRI? MRI is recommended for high-risk individuals. Who's at high risk? Well, if you have a BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation or you're untested but have a first-degree family relative who has a BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation, or if you have a greater than 25% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer by BRCA Pro or similar model. This is a model which, unlike the Gale model, is much more heavily weighted in terms of family history and genetics. 
if you've had a history of radiation to your chest when you were 10 to 30 years old. So some people who fall into this category are people who have had Hodgkin's lymphoma, for example, who have had radiation to their chest. Or if you have Lefermini or Cowden syndrome, all of these individuals are thought of to be high risk. And in this population, MRI may be effective for you on an annual basis um, as an adjunct again uh, to screening mammography. So you'd have an annual MRI and an annual mammogram. Now, whether those two exams occurred at the same time, once a year, or whether they were staggered every six months, mammogram, six months later, MRI, six months later, mammogram, and so on, is really a conversation for you to have with your doctor. But MRI is not for routine screening. Why not? Well, for a few reasons. Number one, it is terribly expensive. It has a high false positive rate, which leads to unnecessary biopsies in many patients. And remember, that can also cause anxiety. Um, because many of the things that are found on MRI actually are completely benign. For anybody who has been in an MRI, particularly for breast, it is highly claustrophobic. So if you have an issue with claustrophobia and need an MRI, you may want to talk to your doctor about getting a, a medication uh, prior to your MRI scan that can help with that. On top of which, MRI, while it doesn't have <clears throat> any radiation exposure, it's driven primarily just on magnetic force, does require the injection of gadolinium, which is a heavy metal. And we know that this gadolinium deposits in our brain. Now, what the long-term effects of gadolinium in your brain are, are still unclear, but it's something to think about. As well, MRI should not be used if you have significant metal uh, in your body, which may be of concern. Now, many of the implants, clips, and so on that are used these days um, are MRI compatible, but you certainly want to check with your doctor about that, as well as if you have a pacemaker, which may have issues uh, with very strong magnets. So in closing, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I hope that everybody out there is really taking good care of their breast health. And that means making sure that you're following screening guidelines. Now, what those screening guidelines are for you may be a personal issue, but I hope that this video has been helpful for you in terms of understanding mammography, the different recommendations with regards to that, the different types of mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. I hope that you will like, share, and subscribe. As always, I hope that this has been helpful for you. Please do pass it along. Uh, we are trying to build a community who really focuses on evidence and best practice when it comes to our health and wellness. Until next time, I'm Dr. Anise Chagpar wishing you all a safe and healthy week.